I begin with the praise that belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace, mercy and blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his beloved family members, upon his beloved companions and upon all of us and our family members. Ameen Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless me in my speech, to remove the defects of my tongue, to make my task easy for me, and bless me and grace me even more out of his grace and mercy so that all of you can understand my speech. I open this talk insha'Allah with a, with a hadith that, will, that has disappointed many people. And when I say many, I mean not common men and women like you and me, but the great, the greats of Islam. Who can be the greats of Islam? The Sahaba. This hadith, by Allah, I'm telling you, haunted the Sahabas so much that they regretted all their life. And this hadith is Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a dream and he saw a vision. And the dream was he saw a sword. He saw a sword. And he saw that sword break at its tip. And this happened exactly before a, a very, very important battle. A battle that they had just won. But this vision came before another important battle that he saw the tip breaking off. And he told it to his Sahabas. And I'll stop and inshallah I'll continue this hadith inshallah in my course of talk. <coughs> Just a quick recap of where we had left. We finished the Battle of Badr, where so many people actually think it was a battle. Right? So many people think it was a battle. But in our last session, we actually realized Allah's Rasul never planned for the battle. He went only to take his, the caravan, the, the wealth that was going from a place to Makkah, you know, from Abu Sufyan. So he gathered about 313 people, so much that when when Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu and he came and asked Rasulullah should I, should I accompany you in this campaign he says no you take care of my daughter right and we know that after this battle his beloved daughter died and Uthman radiallahu anhu he got married again to the second daughter of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam now what happened was in this entire battle the, the Qurayshis when they got the news that Abu Sufyan's caravan with a lot of wealth, a lot of wealth was going to be attacked, they formed an army and they said, let's attack the Muslims. Right? <coughs> now, when Allah's Rasul came to know that this caravan is going, he also knew that this ma the, the wealth that was there in this caravan was all the wealth that before migration the Muslim owned. A lot of them the Muslims owned and so this wealth belonged to the Muslims. So Allah's Rasul was not going in for others' haqq. He was going for his own haqq and the haqq of Muslims. So this we know and how it was planned and the way they settled in. And the, the, when, the, when Allah's Rasul came to know that the Qurayshis are attacking, he asked the people to stand there and support him. And he asked Abu Bakr, uh, so he said, who will stand and, and support me? Abu Bakr was the first man to stand and say, Ya Rasulullah, we will stand, you, stand, by, stand by you. Allah's Rasul says, sit down, Abu Bakr. He says, Umar stands up, he says, Umar, sit down. Meaning, he didn't want these people. 
Because he knew he's they're going to support him. What did he want? He wanted the Ansar to talk. He knew the guys who still lived with him for 15 years, 13 years, are they going to stop backstab Rasulullah on a battlefield? Never. And the likes of Umar and Hamza and, and Abu Bakr and Ali. So he says, you guys sit on, the, the Muhajirin sit on. I want, I want somebody to stand. And Sa'd ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anh, he knew that Allah's Rasul wanted somebody from the Ansar to stand. So a personality like Sa'd ibn Mu'ad stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you go ahead. You go ahead and we will not be like the Jews who said to Musa, you go with your Lord while we stay back. But this time we say, you go with your Lord and by Allah we will follow you. So the battle started. I told you three men from the Qufar and three men from the Muslims had a, had a combat, had a battle and uh, two of them, I mean one of the Muslims was injured and all three died. Now in today's battle, the person who killed Utbah, who killed Utbah? Hamza radiallahu anh, jazakallah khair. He will come into picture. All right? The person who killed Utba, Utba was a very very famous figure in Quraysh and he had a famous daughter named Hind. She comes into play in the battle of Uhud. Now just before we start the battle of Uhud, let's just take a quick any, uh, events, number of events that happened between Badr and Uhud. Which year did we do Badr in? Which year? Which year of Hijr? Second year. Which year of Hijrah was, was uh, Uhud in? Third. So there's a time frame of about one year because the battle of Uhud start, happened in the, battle, uh, in the month of Shawwal. Alright? So Shawwal is just immediately after Ramadan. And we know that the battle of Badr happened in Ramadan. So it's exactly a year. So in this one year and some events that happened after the battle of Badr which we didn't continue, we stopped at the death of of uh, Umayyah bin Khalaf, Abu Jahal, the two young men who killed Abu Jahal, the beautiful story when, when, when uh, Zubair ibn, uh, ibn Awwam radiallahu anh was fighting and he saw two young men and he said, how I wish I had stronger men next to me and both of them said, Aini Abu Jahal, where is Abu Jahal, who is Abu Jahal? He says, what are these two guys asking Abu Jahal? Subhanallah, it was their sword that, that killed Abu Jahal. And then so on. So now we, we ended the battle last time and we didn't do the booty, the war spoils, the war wealth and we didn't do the prisoners. So just a little bit and then inshallah we'll get into battle of Uhud. Now the war booty, if you go back to the previous prophets, does anybody know what happened to wars and what happened to the wealth that the, the prophets won? Subhanallah. It was a miracle of Allah, mu'ajizah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where the likes of Musa alayhi salam, the likes of any, any prophet, any prophet that when they had a war and they, they won and they captured wealth, they captured a lot of wealth, be it gold, silver, sword, whatever, whatever wealth, they would place it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send a fire from the sky and that would get burnt right in front of their eyes. That was how the, the war booty was treated. And Allah's Messenger says that I was, is, I'm, I'm the only prophet that war booty was made halal for me. Subhanallah. One of the, one of the miracles, one of the, uh, uh, the honors that Allah's Rasul got. Second thing that the entire world is made a, made a masjid for me. And so on. And tayammum was made for Allah's Rasul. Right? For this nation. So many many things that Allah's Rasul got on in particular for himself. So when the war got over and there was so much of, there were so many prisoners and wealth, camels, whatever, horses, swords, armors, everything was left. There were three groups of Muslims. Number one, the ones who grabbed the wealth. They said, no, this now belongs to us. Khalas. The one who argued with them and say, just leave it and burn it. Just leave it. It's not ours. The one who stayed back with Rasulullah waiting for his command, what to do. So there were three groups. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with Surah Anfal. He starts that the war booty is for Allah and his Rasul. O you who believe, fix your issues. Why? Because there were three, three small groups that just led to wealth. Subhanallah. You win a war and you see how shaitan comes into you. 
even the likes of the Sahabas. So what happened? Allah's Rasul waited because he didn't know what to do. Then ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down which said that the war booty is halal and <coughs> where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they ask you concerning the war booty, Surah Anfal, Surah number 8 and ayah number 1, they says, yes, uh, yes, alunaka anil anfal, kul, say to them, the anfal is for Allah and His Rasul, walillahi wa rasulihi, fattakullah wa aslihu baynahu, wa aslihu baynakum, that baynakum, so fix your affairs, aslihu is fix your affairs. So then Ali radiallahu an asked Allah's Rasul what should we do with the war booty and from this we understand a fiqh that Allah's Rasul said the war booty is one fifth so if it's hundred percent you remove twenty percent for Allah and his Rasul meaning for, for jihad for fi sabirillah for anything you remove twenty eighty percent is to be distributed amongst those who participate in the, in the battle and this is the and this is haq this is what it is even up till now so 20% of the war booty goes for Allah's cause, <coughs> 80% is what you distribute amongst those who participated. All right? And by the way, it's not like Masjid's Bundi that everybody comes in. It's only for those people who participate. All right? Next, what happened to the prisoners? Again, with regards to the prisoners, there were two issues. There were two views. And the two views came from two greatest Sahabas. Number one was Abu Bakr Siddiq and the number two was Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhuma. When the prisoners were captured, if you know the nature of Abu Bakr, he is more soft in nature. If you know the nature of Umar, he was more stern. So Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, let's ransom them for some money. Let's leave them. Take some money. And Abu Bakr mentioned why. He mentioned, Ya Rasulullah, when you and I take money, today Muslims are are not wealthy, right? We've not won battles after battles. Which was the battle that Muslims really became super rich, like the Ambani's and the and the and the Tatars. Anybody? Subhanallah, the battle of Khaybar. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates. He says, "By Allah, I have never eaten my stomach. I have never filled my stomach up until the battle of Badr. Uh, until up until the battle of Khaybar." The amount of wealth that the Muslims got was phenomenal. The Battle of Khaybar. So they was it was not like really rich a lot of this thing. So when the prisoners were there, Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, let's make some money out of them so that we can have literally like a bank of our own. Right? Let's have some wealth of our own and let's leave these guys. Why? Why? They are our family guys. Correct? No matter what you do, you just had a great battle. But then, when you see your own dad, when you see your own uncle, when you see your own son, the opposite side, you have mercy. You say, Ya Rasulullah, let's. So Allah's Rasul says, Alas, I'll go with Abu Bakr. Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, la. you can't leave these guys. 13 years they were after us. Right? For what all they did. I think the heads the main chiefs of the, uh, the, of the Quraysh should be massacred, should be killed. So Prophet ﷺ says, Allahu Akbar. says, let's go with Abu Bakr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals down a verse. He says, Ya Muhammad, it's not for you to decide. It's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide. Allah chooses Umar's way. Subhanallah. Allah chose Umar's way. And I will, inshallah, if time permits, some of the classes, I will show you six verses from the Quran that Umar chose and Allah backed him up. Six verses, six laws that Umar chose and Allah backed him up. And this is why Allah's Rasul says that had there been a Nabi after me, it would have been Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, because he thought like Nabis, he thought like the Prophets. So then what happened, they killed the senior, the heads and then Allah SWT also gave them a choice that if you want to release some people on ransom, you can do that. So but the, the main heads were, were killed and Abbas radiallahu was ransomed. He was left and later on we know that Abbas became a Muslim but he was a, he was a prisoner of battle of Badr. From this we understand that all the battle of Badr, the prisoners did not die. Alright, so some of them were left for, for money. Now, <clears throat> what happened after this? Number one, Allah's Rasul's daughter died. 
in, during this one year. Second, Abu Sufyan goes back and he sees the entire, because he's not in the battle, he sees this entire situation of what the big guns of Quraysh are no more. The big guns of Quraysh are no more. Abu Talib died a natural death. Abu, Lah Abu Jahal died in the battle. Umayyah bin Khalaf died. Utba died. Shi'ba died. All these massive guys died in the battle of Badr. Who was left? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was left and Abu Sufyan was left. And the ulama say that Abu Lahab, you know, we say in English, right? In English, like a slang, he chickened out. Right? Abu Lahab actually chickened out of the war. He sent somebody else. And when he, when the battle was over, the ulama say that the battle of Badr was the cause of death for Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab also died in the battle of Badr. How? When the Qurayshis came back and the news spread that the Muslims have defeated them, the Qurayshis were in a state of shock. They couldn't even think that the bunch of hundred Muslims that migrated two years back came back and defeated an army of thousand people. It was shocking, absolutely shocking. So they couldn't believe it. So what happened? When Abu Lahab's servant, Abu Lahab's servant, she's a Muslim, she mocks and laughs at Abu Lahab. And he's drunk. So this guy bashes her up. This guy bashes her up because she laughed and mocked. During this entire thing, she takes a big wood wooden stick and she hits his skull and he dies in 3-4 days after a serious injury and the ulema say that this even the battle of Badr was a cause of death to battle of uh, to Abu Lahab and this is what Allah's messenger Allah SWT says in the Quran the Mustahazi'un there's a group of people who mock who laughed at Rasulullah who, who yani, uh, tortured Rasulullah or rather were, tortured the Muslims Allah will make them Allah will take care of their death and this is how everybody else died. Now in this one year, Abu Sufyan became the leader. Now eventually Abu Sufyan becomes who? Who? A Muslim, but in relation to Rasulullah? Father-in-law. Subhanallah. He later on, Abu Sufyan becomes the father-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So whose daughter, what's the daughter's name? Um Habiba. Ahsant. Then Allah's Rasul in this time he knew that the Qurayshis will not stop. He knew that they will come back. So what he did was he tried to get more allies. He tried to get more allies and sign up contracts that if the Quraysh come back again you are going to help us. So he started preparing people that you are going to face more threat. And in this one year Abu Sufyan goes back when he becomes the leader now he's trying to repay that defeat. He's going to come back and he says, we cannot stop for two reasons. Abu Sufyan wanted to do, wanted to attack for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to get back at the defeat of Muslims. Second, the route to, of Medina was an important channel of trade. It was a very, very important channel to Yemen, to Syria, to Damascus. A lot of these countries that, I mean, a lot of these countries that the, the root of Medina was. So he wanted to defeat Medina and open the channel of trade. Because once that is closed, your economy is also affected. So exactly after one year, Abu Sufyan is ready with how many people? 3,000 people. How many people? Badr? 1,200, 300. Alright? 3,000 men in the battle of Uhud. He was ready. And this happened, the date of this war was Shawwal, the third Hijri. Alright? Then, when Allah's Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that Abu Sufyan is coming with 3,000 men, he went to the masjid, called the big guns of the Sahaba, and unfortunately, one of the big guns of Medina was Abdullah ibn Salul. Who is he? Apart from being your uncle, the head of Munafiq, all right. So he was present, and he they were discussing, and there was a consultation done by Allah's Rasul, and Allah's Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Let us fight in the streets of Medina. Let us fight in the streets of Medina." 
The Sahaba has responded saying, Ya Rasulullah, let's not do that. Last time we defeated them, last time we took them on on a battlefield in an open area. Let's not do, let's not do that this time. Allah's Rasul said, let us stick and let us fight in the battle, in, uh, in the streets. The Sahabas, the senior Sahabas, senior Sahabas said, no Ya Rasulullah, let's go to the battlefield. Now, some of the authors, they write that sometimes what happens when you, when you're 300 people facing 1000 people, what happens and you win? What happens? Overconfidence. Moreover, when you know angels are fighting for you, subhanallah. You're like, where's my star, man? Right? So, they, are, they know that they can't lose. They know, khalas, 300 men defeated 1,000 people. It's impossible. And that too, 300 men who were not prepared for war took on 1,000 people, 1,000 plus people. So they were very confident, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry. We have it covered, we'll go to the battlefield. Allah Rasul says, fine, let's go to the battlefield. And he gets up and he walks out. Some of the Sahabas felt this, that they, they should have listened to Rasulullah. The first disobedience of the Battle of Uhud was in this consultation. Everybody talks about the archers. That was the second disobedience. The first disobedience was, by done, was done by the senior companions of Rasulullah. When they said, Ya Rasulullah, let's go out in the battlefield. Rasulullah said, no, we'll get more in numbers. We'll get more numbers if we stick to our streets. Let, us, let them come into Medina and we'll have a better chance. Rasulullah said, fine, fine, let's fight them in the battlefield. Rasulullah gets up and he walks out. Some of the senior companions criticized those companions who went against Allah's Rasul. And then they said, Hamza radiallahu anhu, he says, you are the uncle of Rasulullah, you go and talk to Rasulullah. You go and talk and see what he is, what he has to do. So Hamza radiallahu anhu goes to the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is wearing his armor. He's, he's pulling up his sword, his spear, he's wearing his helmet, he's wearing his armor. And Hamza says, Ya Rasulullah, what's up with you? He says, now this will never be removed. Once the Prophet wears this, it will never be removed. And Hamza radiallahu anhu felt that they should have listened to Rasulullah. He goes out, he meets the senior companions and he criticizes them. He says, we should have listened to Rasulullah. Now that Allah Rasul has made up his mind, let's go. Thousand people gather, they give their names. Thousand people give their names. Abdullah ibn Salul, he is there in the masjid and he says, O Prophet Muhammad, O Muhammad, we'll, you'll have 300 from my side. So 700 from the Ansar and the Muhajirin and 300 from the Munafiqin. So 1000. How many were there in the Battle of Badr? 300. Exactly three times. The 1000 of Badr became 3000 of, of Munafiqin. Uh, sorry, 1000 of Badr became 3000 of, uh, of the Quraysh and 300 plus of Muslims became 1000 of Uhud. Allah's Rasul is ready. They are ready to go. The next morning, Allah's Rasul prays and he leaves. And he goes and he's about to leave the city while Abdullah ibn Salul, he's standing at the gates of Medina and he, and he sees it, Rasulullah. And Allah's Messenger and the Sahabas look at him. The Muslim group looks at him and they say, what's happening? He says, you know what? We've decided not to come for war. The morning of Battle of Uhud, 300 Munafiqeens back out. Subhanallah. How much is the ratio now? From 1 is to 3 it became? 1 is to 4. Correct? 1000 versus 3000 was 1 is to 3. 700 versus 3000? 1 is to 4 ratio. Subhanallah. The Sahabas, Allah's Rasul just kept quiet. He didn't talk. Some of the Sahabas went back. When the Munafiqin left the gates and they, went, they were going back to Medina and they were criticizing the decision of Rasulullah to go and fight, some of the Sahabas went back and they pleaded. They pleaded to the Munafiqin saying that, join us, don't, don't betray us at this, at this time, in this morning. The Munafiqin laughed, mocked and they abused them and they sent back. They sent them back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a beautiful verse of Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Anu 166 and 167. Subhanallah. That verse is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what, what befell you on the day when the two, bat, two parties met, that is the day of Uhud, was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order, now what Allah says, in order that he may trust the true believers and distinguish 
the believers from the munafiqeen subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this on purpose to the munafiqeen back out and Allah sent this verse that Allah did it on purpose as, his, as, as the will of Allah to differentiate between the true believers and the munafiqeen so when the 300 munafiqeen were left out or rather went back subhanallah all their life they were labeled as munafiqeen why because they backed out so the 700 men something phenomenal happens in this battle and that is women participated in two ways all right we'll come to that later on inshallah then when they were about to proceed Allah's Rasul looked around and he saw 12 13 probably 14 years old kids he saw these boys 11 12 13 and they were with armor and they were with swords and he looked at them and he said go back those sahabas, this small kids, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we're not going to go back now. He says, no, go back. And you know who he sent? He sent 14 boys. 14 boys. And I want to read the name so that you understand one thing. Subhanallah. Number one, he sent back Abdullah ibn Umar. Radiallahu an. Second, he sent back Zaid ibn Thabit. Radiallahu an. Where do you connect these two people? In terms of what? Knowledge. Subhanallah, knowledge. Look at the wisdom of Rasulullah. You know who is number three? Usama bin Zaid radiallahu an. Again, knowledge. Number four, Barra ibn Azib radiallahu an. How many hadith has Barra ibn Azib narrated? Subhanallah. The hadith of the grave. The most famous hadith is Barra ibn Azib. Allah's Rasul sent back uh, Zaid ibn Arqam radiallahu an. All these young, fascinating sahabas sent back. Why? Because Allah's Messenger looked at the future. Looked at the future. Young boys taking the... Today's topic was what? Bearing the torch, sharing the, spreading the light. Young boys taking on Islam on their shoulders. Knowledge. Subhanallah. And this is what Allah SWT gave permission in Surah At-Tawbah. When you are, in, bat, when you are in, a, in, a, in a battlefield, you are allowed to keep the ulema so that they will teach. Right? Don't let the ulama go into the battlefield. What happens if they die? Who's there to teach? SubhanAllah, Allah has given permission that the scholars of Islam stay back and teach. However, by your will you want to come? Alhamdulillah. So these 14 kids, these 14 boys were left back. And one of them was again a famous companion, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anh. Again, very very famous in knowledge. All these are massive names. Then came Umar and his brother. Umar's, who knows Umar's, uh, who knows Umar radiallahu anh's brother's name? How can you forget Zaid, man? Famous personality, I mean. Subhanallah, how can you forget my name? I'm there in the Quran, I'm there in the Hadith, I'm there as Umar's brother, I'm there as Allah's Rasul's adopted son. Subhanallah, man. What's, uh, you should fix your mind. Huh? So Umar radiallahu anh, he comes from his house, and he's without an armor. He's without anything. He's just in sword. And he sees his brother just like him. And he says to his brother, Zed, go back and wear your armor. He says, go back. He says, no. For the reason you have come out, I have come out too for the same reason. He says, what reason? He says, I want Jannah. Khalas. I don't want to live. He says, I want to die without an armor. So Umar says, Khalas, let's go. So both the brothers actually went together for battle of Uhud. All right. Then comes, when they reach the battle of Uhud, when they reach the battle place, Allah's Rasul, remember, this is just outside of Medina. This is not like 150 kilometers or 100 miles away from Medina that like Badr they had to go. It was just outside. Today, the city has expanded so much that the, the, the Uhud is inside Medina. Alright? Uh, there was a hadith that Allah's Rasul would say that whenever we saw Uhud, we knew Medina has arrived. That's how close Medina was. So, if you see the battle, if you see the Uhud mountain, these are massive mountains and one of the small mountains were where Allah Rasul placed about 50 archers, alright? Now, today probably they've knocked down a lot of mountains but that time there was a small entrance to Medina and the battlefield was in front, there was a small entrance to Medina from, from the battle of Uhud, from the Uhud mountains, mountain head. So Allah's Rasul sallallahu didn't want people to enter from that place into Medina as well the backside 
the Mount of Uhud faced the back of, of the Muslims. So this was the battle, the Mount of Uhud was right here. So if the Qurayshis came from this side and tried to attack from the Muslims behind, the archers were placed there. So Allah's Rasul placed Abdullah ibn Jubair radiallahu an as the head of the archers. And he was a very good person, a very skilled person. So he placed him as the head and he said, this person is your Amir. And then Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said a beautiful statement, beautiful statement. And I'll read this, his quote. He said, Allah said, do not abandon your position even, subhanallah, even if you see vultures eating us. When's the position of when vultures are eating? Dead carcass. So he said, do not leave your positions even if you see vultures circling over our heads or eating us until I send my word. So this is Allah's Rasul's command, khalas, you just can't leave it. So he kept 50 great archers there and the Qurayshis made a plan to split because the battlefield, the Uhud was big, they could attack from behind. So the Qurayshis, Abu Sufyan was a very intelligent man, he split his army into two groups. One, he made two very important personalities. Who knows those two important personalities who led the, the, the army from behind. Number one was Khalid ibn Walid. Everybody knows it. Who knows the second? Iqrama ibn Abi Jahal. The son of Abu Jahal. He becomes a great scholar in Islam by the way. Subhanallah. The son of Abu Jahal becomes a great scholar of Islam. Radiallahu anhuma. Khalid ibn Walid and Iqrama ibn Abi Jahal radiallahu anhuma. Abu Sufyan makes them and says you attack from behind. However, they did not know the archers were placed there. So, Abu Sufyan and Allah's Rasul faced face to face. <coughs> and the entire Muslim army was in front and Allah's Rasul got a sword. Allah's Rasul got two swords, one for himself and he removed the sheath, removed the sheath of, the, of the second and he raised it high. And he says, who wants it? Everybody raised their hands. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I want it, I want it. And then he said, who will fulfill its right? Who will fulfill its right? Subhanallah. Lo and behold, everybody put their hands down. Everybody put their hands down because they knew fulfilling its right means you have to give everything you have. Everything. You can't even have a speck of doubt. Everybody put their hands except for one man. His name was? Abu Dujan. Subhanallah, may Allah bless you. Abu Dujana, the man with the red band. He was, known as the, he was known as Abu Dujana, the man with the red band. He lifted his hand and said, Rasulullah, I will fulfill the right of that. So Rasulullah gave the sword and Subhanallah, you know what he did? Subhanallah. He took a red band and he tied it around his head. And he was literally like dancing in front of everybody, saying that this is the sword of Rasulullah that came to me. And Allah Rasul saw it and he says, Subhanallah, Allah hates this act except in the battlefield. <laughs> Allah hates this act showing off. Allah hates this act except in a battlefield. So this was Abu Dujana radiallahu anh, and he fought, he fought like Subhanallah, he was like a mountain by himself, an army by himself. Then what happened? The battle started and the Muslims were winning. Subhanallah, the Muslims were winning and they were killing the, the, the Kuffar and Abu uh, Khalid bin Walid and Ikrama ibn Abi Jahal came from behind and they, they to, to, to their surprise Allah's Rasul was a better planner and he had kept 50 archers and what can you do when you're on a horse and a sword when people are actually throwing arrows at you you can't do anything so what happened arrows fell and their army too weakened uh, Abu Khalid bin Walid stepped back he stepped back but he was smart enough not to go back. He was there and hiding behind a mountain. He just wanted to see if those people go down. Then what happened was a lot of events happened. Many kuffar killed, was, were killed. Then <coughs> what I'll do is I'll just run through you some sahaba, some really really important and fascinating names of battle of Uhud. Who died, alright, who died. Number one is the uncle of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa the greatest of uncles and he gets a position of the king of martyrs in Jannah who was his name? 
Hamza radiallahu an. Just a quick story of Hamza radiallahu an. He was he accepted Islam while in a in a state of anger, and then realized after that, and then he still stayed as a Muslim, and he really supported Islam to the best. He was a warrior by by nature, and he was very very strong. And nobody, nobody yani, could put him down and they feared Hamza radiallahu anhu. And this is the same man that he said that when Umar came with a sword to kill Rasulullah, out of all the Sahabas, it was Hamza radiallahu anhu who said, Ya Rasulullah, step back, I kill him with his own sword. Subhanallah, that was Hamza radiallahu anhu. And during the battle of Uhud, Badr, when he killed Utbah in the first, in the first battle, the daughter of Utbah, Hind, swore and he, she took an oath that she is going to get back at this man. She is going to get back at this man because he took the, 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 his fa her father's death and also her brother's death. Then she hired a person who was very good at like, like throwing the javelin like a spear. All right? she, he was very very good. Later on, Alhamdulillah, even he becomes a Muslim. But Rasulullah says something about Wahshi. His name was Wahshi. He says, whenever I saw Wahshi's face, I remember the death of Hamza radiallahu anhu. So she called Wahshi and she, gave, she told Wahshi, she gave her an initial amount and said, by Allah, you will have my jewelry, you will have my wealth, you have everything, but get me Hamza. Get me Hamza dead. So this man participated in the battle of Uhud, not with the intention of killing Muslims, but the intention of getting wealth. So he stood behind a massive rock and he waited to get a clear sight at Hamza. Hamza radiallahu anhu was fighting and when he got a clear shot, he threw the spear into Hamza's back. Complete Hamza's back. And Hamza radiallahu anhu died. Just not died, when he died, he fell down and, he, and Allah took his soul away. This man, Wahshi, came with a, and he took Hamza's sword and he cut open his stomach. And he removed his liver and he went to Hind. And he went back to Hind the same day, I mean, uh, during this process. And he goes back to Hind and he says, this is the liver of Hamza. And then she says, no, I want to, I want to know whether Hamza is dead. So she sends somebody else and they confirm that Hamza radiallahu anh, died. So she eats that liver. That was how much she hated Hamza radiallahu anh. But some ulama, subhanallah, say, it was the blood of a Muslim that went into her and she accepted Islam. Allahu alam yani that Allah, Allah opens, you eat a liver and you become a goat. <laughs> right? You don't do that. But inshallah, that's some, some small view, but I don't accept that. It is Allah who opens hearts and it cannot come out of a person's liver or person's tongue or person's leg or hand. Alright? So next time, don't try to give a. a a leg or a hand to somebody and say, you eat this man, I'm telling you. Amazing, alright? No. Just keep that outside. So, however, she ate the liver and it was a very, very bad death because they had literally, Wahshi had literally cut open Hamza in a very, very bad way. And I'm, I'm still leaving the battlefield but I'm jumping to Hamza Mahun's death because I want to take some phenomenal personalities. Alright? I'll come back to the battlefield. When Hamza died, Allah's Rasul called for his body and he is one body, one body that Sahaba said we never saw Allah's Rasul's tears falling for, subhanAllah. When Hamza was lying down, they got a sheet. He was so massive and so tall. However, this hadith is also narrated to different Sahabas, but this also is Sahih. They covered Hamza radiallahu anh, and her sister whose name? What's her name? Safiya radiallahu anha subhanallah Safiya and Hamza are brothers and sisters and the uncle and aunt of Rasulullah sallallahu her sister she came to and she had a son uh, uh, Zubair Zubair was Hamza's son so Zubair and Safiya radiallahu anha she came and she said to oh my nephew I want to see my brother Allah Rasul says oh my aunt I don't give you the permission to see him she says why? he says you can't take it the way they have cut open Hamza's body is you can't take it. So she says, no, I will. Allah Rasul insists saying that you can't take it. She says, no, I want to see my brother's body. This again shows, alhamdulillah, 
that women have a right to see bodies <laughs> all right dead bodies something really strange right in india india so when hamza you was face was opened she looked and she only prayed for jannah and allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi replies saying that this man has indeed got jannah and in fact he will be the king of martyrs the next <coughs> was then when what happened was the war was almost over the muslims were winning and they saw the Qureshis run they saw the Qureshis run and they leaving their animals their wealth whatever they ran so when people started collecting the war booty a person from the mountain from the archers shouted saying oh muslims we have won let's go down and collect our share abdullah ibn jubair radiallahu an the head of the spearmen the head of the, the archers shouted oh muslims ittaqullah fear allah and obey rasulullah for allah's rasul gave us a command not to move our positions and they said we will miss our booty allahu akbar we will miss our wealth the sahabas what wealth can do imagine what are you and i when the sahabas itself at the mount of ahud left everything and ran down out of 50 there were only about three or four remaining who really stuck uh, stood for Allah's command and when they went down Khalid bin Walid was watching and he attacked and he attacked and three men couldn't do anything and they killed a few but Khalid bin Walid and Ikram ibn Abi Jahal radiallahu anhuma as of now they entered the battlefield from behind the Muslims suddenly what happened when they attacked the Muslims from behind the Muslims turned and ran towards them the Qureshis who were running saw an opportunity and they turned back too now this was a disaster that happened in the battle of Uhud and this is why a lot of people write down the, the, the people who write Sirah sometimes they write that the Muslims lost this battle unfortunately yes they disobeyed they lost a lot of lives and wealth but technically they did not lose the battle because Allah's Rasul was still living and Abu Sufyan left at that time afterwards so what happened was I'll tell you that when when the Qureshis came back the Muslims were like a sandwich they were in the middle with Khalid and Walid attacking from this side and the Qureshis that were had left were coming back again now there was a fierce battle and the Muslims now were tested they were really really tested and the Muslims were fighting so much so that it came to a point that they almost entered the major territory of Rasulullah's camps of the senior companions camps and Rasulullah was one in one of the camps and when the senior Sahabas saw that the Khalid bin Wali's army is attacking inside the camps of Rasulullah and, and, the, and the women now in this battle there were women participating in two ways number one the women came out Aisha radiallahu and Fatima radiallahu and so many women came out and they were nursing men they were basically they became nurses for the prison uh, for the for the people who were injured for the injured for uh, for the people who were injured they were nursing so subhanallah this this shows us something phenomenal that women should come out and participate in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala women should come out don't stick there if you know there's a good cause come out and help the battle of Uhud is the greatest example and one of the strongest ladies that ever lived in his in history was a lady called Nusayba radiallahu anha so much so that she was with a she was with a sword and when the Qureshis came into the camp of Rasulullah they did not know which tent Rasulullah is staying inside Rasulullah was inside the tent Rasulullah came out the some of the Sahabas covered him and pushed him inside and the Sahabas were Saad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu an Talha ibn uh, Ubaidullah uh, Talha radiallahu an Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu an Nusayba radiallahu an Musa ibn Umair radiallahu an now who are these people let me just start Musa ibn Umair radiallahu an was the man who was sent from Mecca to Medina first if you go back to history our seerah the first person to send to be sent as an ambassador who led the first Juma was who Musa ibn Umair radiallahu an in Medina tall handsome young 
and there was a, there was a narration that amongst the sahabas who were not related amongst the sahabas the most closest looking personality of rasulullah was in musaib ibn umair radiyallahu an he looked identical very very close he was so so handsome and so beautiful that at the age of 13 31 he, he had proposals of rich women coming and he was from a very very rich uh, background from family but when he accepted Islam his mother kicked him out his mother tortured, tortured him a lot but yet he lived with the Muslims when the Muslim army when the Qureshi's army attacked Rasulullah's camp they did not know which tent it was the Sahabas had surrounded the camp and for a fact that they knew that Muhammad is inside this camp and they attacked this, this tent so much that Rasulullah even came out and one of them said this is Muhammad and he struck Allah's Rasul with a sword he struck on his helmet there are narrations that said Allah's Rasul's skin and the scalp split open and one of them got a, one of them hit Rasulullah with, with the edge of the spear and his tooth broke and his entire face was bleeding and Rasulullah somehow fell down he fell down and he fell down unconscious he fell down uh, he didn't fall at this point of time many conversations happened I'll tell you some of them one was Saad al Abi Waqas radiallahu an, who stood and they made Allah's Rasul to stand in the center and they had surrounded Allah's Rasul Nusayra was one of them Talha, Saad ibn Abi Waqas, Musaib ibn Umar all these great Sahabas had surrounded Rasulullah and people were fighting Allah's Rasul took the spear, took an bow and arrow and gave it to Saad radiallahu an, Abi Waqas and he said Ya Rasulullah you stay behind my back for surely this chest will protect you Subhanallah Allah's Rasul, he is the man, he is the only man, he is the only man on earth, Saad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu an, that Allah's Rasul said, may my mother and father be sacrificed for you, ya Saad, subhanAllah. The only man on earth, nobody got this privilege that Allah's Rasul said, everybody used to say, Ya Rasulullah, may my mother and father be sacrificed on you. But Saad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu an, is the only man that Allah's Rasul said, may my father and mother be sacrificed on you. <coughs> Then Talha, Talha radiallahu an, he, in fact there was a spear that was coming to Allah's Rasul's neck and he put his right hand so much so that it, it injured him, his entire hand was paralyzed for his entire life. And Allah's Messenger Sallallahu used to say, look at that walking shaheed, subhanallah, he used to say, look at that walking shaheed going by us. He, he paralyzed his hand. And then Nusayba radiallahu anh, she fought, she fought hard and she died. And then when Allah's Rasul fell down, fell down, somebody said, somebody heard a voice saying, who is Muhammad in this? Who is Muhammad? The Qurayshis did not know because Allah's Rasul had migrated and these, all, all these 3,000 people were new. So he said, who is Muhammad in this? Musayb ibn Umayr radiallahu anh, he comes out and says, Ana Muhammad. He says, Ana Muhammad. And all of them jump and they kill him. And he dies. And Musaib ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, he dies in the battlefield of Uhud. He dies. When he dies, the Qurayshi shout, Al Uzza, Allah, we have won. Because Muhammad is no more. And for them, he looked like Muhammad. He had that nur in his face. And they killed him. They said, Allah al Uzza, we have won and Muhammad is dead. So they retreated and they went back. This was their message. This was their this thing. They didn't want to win and capture. They wanted to kill Muhammad. Khalas, that's it. And they knew if Allah's Rasul was, was dead, everything was over. So they went back and they left. While they were leaving, some of them heard the rumors that Muhammad is dead. Muhammad is dead. Muhammad is dead. So many sahabas so many sahabas there is a number which says more more than hundred they left their sword they left their spear spear they left everything and they walked back to medina the sahabas looked and they said fight the sahabas they says no muhammad is dead khalas and unfortunately one of them was uthman bin afan radiallahu an. and this even to this day the shias complain that he was the man who turned his back towards Allah Rasul in the Mount of uh, in the Battle of Uhud. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. Allah revealed an ayat after the Battle of Uhud that Allah forgave all of them. 
Subhanallah, what else do you need? Answer is there in the Quran. Look, open the surah. Allah says, Allah forgave all the people who turned their back in the battle of Uhud and left. Because their intention was not to turn their backs. Their intention was what? To fight for Allah's cause. And when they thought Allah's messenger is not there, Islam is over. Allahu Akbar. So the likes of Uthman and Affan, عنه, he went back. And then what happened? When he left, a lot of people were still fighting. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a beautiful verse in the Quran. And I want to narrate that verse. <coughs> he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we withheld, we withheld, when you disobey, we will withheld our we will we will withhold our help. When you disobey, Allah will withhold his help. And this is what had happened. Because they disobeyed, the angels were not sent by Allah. It was another shock for Allah's uh, for the Muslims. The angels were not sent. Then looking at this point of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two mighty angels, subhanallah. Jibreel alayhi salam and Mika alayhi salam. They came down and they stood by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa guarding him. While he was unconscious, they guarded him. And Allah sent forces. Allah sent angels to destroy the kuffar. And they destroyed them. And that's when the Qurayshis saw this happening and they left. And they left. While they, while they were leaving, the, the, the Sahabas like Abu Bakr, Umar and all of them came and they picked up Allah's Rasul. They washed his Fatima radiallahu anh, she narrates herself that when Allah's Rasul came, I saw my father's face completely bleeding. Completely bleeding. And I was the one who put water and we woke him up. And when they woke him up, they went back. They went back to the Mount of Uhud. They were standing there. And Abu Sufyan comes. He comes with some two, three men and he shouts, Is Muhammad alive? On the mount, Allah's Rasul is there and they are hiding behind it. Abu Bakr was there, Umar was there. And Allah's Rasul some responds, I mean he tells Abu Bakr and Umar, stay quiet. Abu Sufyan says, is Muhammad alive? Allah's Rasul says, stay quiet. And then Abu Sufyan says, today Muhammad has lost, Allah and Al-Uzza have won. Allah has lost and Allah and Allah al Uzza have won. Al Manat have won. Umar radiallahu anh says, Ya Rasulullah, I can't keep quiet now. He responds, Ya Abu Sufyan, the one you think is dead, subhanallah, lo and behold, he is alive with us. The one you think has won, Allah and Uzza, they are only idols. For the surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us victory. And Allah is the ever Allah is the ever living and he will never die. Surely we, will have, we have got victory. And then Abu Sufyan says, This battle was for the loss of Badr. This battle was the loss of Badr. And he turns and he goes away. And there was one lady, subhanAllah. It's nothing about the battle of Uhud, but her reaction to Allah's Rasul. When she heard, when the news spread in Medina that Allah's Rasul is dead, the Munafiqin rejoiced. The munafiqin rejoiced. The hypocrites were really happy. And when the news spread, one lady came to the battle, to the Mount of Uhud. And when she was coming, some people stopped her and said, Oh lady, your father is no more. He died in the battle of Uhud. And she says, I'm not bothered. Tell me about Rasulullah. And she walks ahead. And another person comes and stops and says, your son is killed in the battle of Uhud. And she says, I'm not bothered, tell me about Rasulullah. Another person comes and says, your husband is dead in, Ras in the battle of Uhud. He says, I'm not bothered, tell me about Rasulullah. Subhanallah. It's such an amazing thing to see this Iman. Where is that Iman? Forget women, where is that Iman in men today? Allahu Akbar. These were quality Muslims that just, for them Allah's Rasul was everything. That's it. For them Allah's Rasul was everything. No matter what happened, be it father, be it mother, be it son, for them Allah's Rasul was everything. Today unfortunately we've kept that behind. We've kept them behind. Get them in front and you see the Iman, the sweetness of Iman. Another beautiful personality is called, is, his name is Hanzala radiallahu anh. It's a beautiful story of Hanzala and Hanzala radiallahu anh is a person who got married. He got married very recently, just before Uhud. And 
when he got married the call to Uhud was made the call to Uhud was made so he went in and he and he slept with, with his wife and he had a relationship and when he woke up Allah's Rasul they called out and he came out just like that he, didn't, he was in a sin of Janaba he didn't perform Ghusl he just came out like that they went he fought and he died when he died Allah's Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when the battle is over he said get all the people and there were 70 Muslims that died that day 70 Muslims that died and major Sahabas they said get me all the bodies so when they started getting the bodies they found Hanzala radiallahu an and it's they found it to be wet it was wet and the Sahabas were surprised he says subhanallah why is this body wet desert there's no rain didn't rain this body is wet Allah Rasul said get them and when they touched and when Allah Rasul put the body the, the drops of water were falling down and they said Ya Rasulullah what is this he says subhanallah this man was in a state of janaba and he did not do ghusl the angels gave him a bath subhanallah the angels gave him a bath on the day of Uhud and he was buried just like that it's amazing subhanallah then this is how the battle of Uhud took place where there were disappointments and if you look at this entire thing there were three reasons why you look at a failure of battle of Uhud even though at the end of the day subhanallah Allah Rasul was alive but as, a, as, a, as this group of sahabas they looked at it as a loss because they lost 70 sahabas when you look at the battle of Uhud there was number one when Allah Rasul wished to fight in the city the sahabas were overconfident of going into battlefield number one overconfidence always kills us yes or no number two when Allah's Rasul commanded them not to leave the mount they left disobedience yes or no disobedience led to the loss of in at, at Uhud third what is the reason that they came down wealth wealth greed so from this we understand the sahabas could disobey Allah's Rasul the sahabas could fall in the traps of shaitan with the wealth how much do you and I have to check our iman subhanallah the battles of the battles of Rasulullah are great great lessons and from today inshallah we finished Badr, we finished Uhud we'll go on and we finish some major battles my advice to you is don't miss the remaining part of Rasulullah's life it's phenomenal subhanallah alright so <clears throat> with that some lessons that we learned from the battle of Uhud number one is no matter what you are no matter how powerful or how, how many times you have won never be overconfident put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one second is disobedience to Allah and his Rasul number three is worldly wealth number four something phenomenal sisters you guys participated in the battle of Badr subhanallah the likes of Nusayba where are they the likes of Fatima Aisha where are they we find you in commercial street more come on come out be a part of any Islamic organization whatever no matter you don't have to be a part of this anything you feel be a part of it be actively involved whatever it may take be associated the women showed this in the battle of Uhud today honestly how many sisters really have the guts to go out in a war if this happens I don't know forget sisters men will sit down right so very very important inshallah that we understand women need we need your participation sisters Islam is not a religion to bind you in your houses trust me everybody think that you have to wear your hijab and niqab you can do everything with all the Islamic Islamic uh, Sharia be associated be a part of anything inshallah and next is the courage that people show is inshallah try to learn iman lessons from this 
brothers, sisters, both try to learn lessons of Iman, inshaAllah. Alright? With that, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu wa ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.